The Sign Institute of Policy and Politics is American University's incubator for policy innovation. We convene leaders in the academic, public, private, nonprofit, and journalism sectors to engage and promote common ground and nonpartisan solutions. In an evolving world, we seize the opportunity to work on the nation's most pressing challenges through collaboration by experts and top scholars in their field with students in research and scholarship. As part of that goal, the Sign Institute leverages American University's location in our nation's capital, the nexus of government and a growing international business center. We connect diverse perspectives from around the country and around the world with our world-class academics and research, experienced practitioners, and the most politically active student body in the U.S. We stand apart through our focus on the role of business and the nonprofit community in public policy the rise of the importance of economic regions in the United States, and international policy issues. Our focus is to make an immediate impact at the intersection of policy and politics that leads to real and lasting change. Thank you for joining us as we convene, communicate, and collaborate. And now introducing 2023 Sign Fellow, Terrence Samuel. Hi, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well, welcome. Uh, my name is Benjamin Bryant. I am the comms director for the Sign Institute. On behalf of Sign and myself, I want to welcome you to Terrence Samuel's third Sign Seminar. Yay! Oh. <laughs> the Sign Institute is where the brightest minds convene and engage to promote common ground and nonpartisan solutions to today's biggest challenges. Sign is where American University comes to convene, communicate, and collaborate. Today, we are honored once again to have Sign Fellow Terrence Samuel joining us, along with his featured guest, Rachel Farr. Terrence Samuel is Vice President and Executive Editor at NPR, where he oversees all news gathering for the broadcast network. He is also the author of the 2010 book, The Upper House, A Journey Behind the Closed Doors of the United States Senate. Terrence has worked at several major news publications, including the Washington Post, where he oversaw White House congressional coverage as Deputy National Political Editor, Joining Terrence is Rachel Pulfer, who currently serves as the Executive Director of Journalists for Human Rights, Canada's leading international media development organization. She has experienced co-creating, piloting, implementing, scaling, and evaluating human rights and media development programs in Africa and the Middle East, as well as working for indigenous rights at home in Canada. Terrence and Rachel have joined us on campus today to continue the conversation on news deserts and disinformation and how the crisis in local news is destabilizing global democracy. They'll also discuss the important role that strong journalism could play in preserving democracy in the US and worldwide. Um, one other note, if you have a question, please enunciate at the end when we enter the Q&A section. So it's nice and loud for our recording. Thank you. Please join me in welcoming Terrence Samuel and Rachel Pulver. Uh, It is really nice to see you guys here. Um, I know it's really nice outside. And for you to be in this room with us this afternoon says something about you. I don't know what. <laughs> I'm really glad you're here. You care about democracy. That's what it says. Excellent. Um, so as you've heard, this is the third installment in this discussion. But for Rachel and I, it is our second discussion this week on these very important topics. Um, we talked about this uh, on Monday in Toronto. Uh, that discussion was mostly about disinformation. And the thing that it brought home to me was how all the things we've been talking about, disinformation, local news, democracy, uh, are all connected in, in like a really interesting and urgent way that we need to deal with. Um, I'm gonna, so we're, we're gonna talk a lot about people You've heard me say this before. I think all stories need to be local stories because if we put people at the center of those stories, um, 
then they're very local. Um, Rachel's going to talk a lot about that. The reason she's here is because we had a discussion one evening where she, let's just say she uh, impressed me with her enthusiasm on the subject. <laughs> <laughs> um, but journalists for human rights is kind of a novel concept and in American journalism it almost sounds like an advocacy organization um, and there was a lot of discussion earlier this week when we talked about advocacy and journalism and whether they can coexist so I'm going to start with this question for you, and you can answer it. And when, you, when we talk about democracy, when we talk about local news, when we talk about human rights, this seems to be everything you've been working on. What is the connection for you in those things? All questions. Am I on here? Can you hear me? Uh, first of all, I would just want to say thank you to Terry and the Sign Institute. It's a real honor to be here, and I'm really interested in hearing all of your questions when we get to that stage. Uh, thank you for taking the time. Uh, democracy matters. It's important. Uh, and journalism is fundamental. Strong journalism is fundamental to strong democracy. Uh, the through line, if I may, uh, which I have seen throughout my career. Before this discussion, Terry reminded me of some of my early uh, local journalism work with the Montreal Gazette, uh, chasing biker gangs and uh, uh, kosher meat factories and various other types of stories that you do when you are a beat reporter at a large metropolitan daily. Uh, the through line is indeed people. And it's about centering people in coverage, centering their issues, and showing people, both those you interview and those who are your audience or readership, that journalists work for people. Journalists work for the common good, the public good, uh, and they do the work to ensure that people are informed about what is going on in their local democracy. And that never could I, I it's, it's hard to stress how basic and yet how fundamental that is. So I'm gonna take you to a completely different environment uh, Liberia, uh, post-conflict Liberia, which is one of the places that Journalists for Human Rights was working when I first uh, started working at the organization. Liberia was known as the country that basically invented the concept of the child soldier in a particularly brutal civil war that went on for almost 14 years. International donors knew this. And so in the post-conflict phase, lots and lots of donor agencies were throwing money at Liberia to rehabilitate the education system, because there was an entire generation of child soldiers who needed to be educated in order to advance in their lives. When I got to Liberia, the media sector in that country was hyper-partisan. Sound familiar? Basically, every single media outlet seemed to be taking sides in a national debate about politics and everything was about politics. Who's up, who's down, what side are you on? Do you support X or Y? Do you support Johnson Sirleaf, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, or do you support George Weah, who is actually now the president? Everything was about politics. And so our first request to our media partners there was take the politics out of your coverage. Your job is to write about people, but people in the center of what you're writing about put these child soldiers experiences in the center of stories about the education system, for example, and you will see your readership go up and you will see that people are going to put more faith in what you do, more trust in what you do. And so we decided initially to focus on this issue of education because we had journalists we were working with across the country and they were reporting back that so many of these schools despite this huge influx of cash from international donor agencies, were not, the teachers weren't getting paid, kids were sitting four to a desk, the schools were in a terrible state of repair. We had outlets from across the country report on this to show the systemic nature of the problem. That also, by the way, was a security strategy so that you know, if you have one journalist, one outlet reporting on this issue from one perspective, 
but it's easy to shut that down if you're dealing with a, a government that may or may not decide to abide by the rule of law, depending upon the, the day, the time, the month, whatever. But if there's 20 all covering it from different angles, it's a systemic problem. And that turns into a national story. Johnson Sirleaf had to act. She fired her minister for corruption. Money started to flow to the education system. People saw in those local newsrooms, you know, local news communities, that it was the journalists who platformed the teachers and the students in a way that not only showed that their issues mattered, both locally and on a national scale, but that something could be done about it and something was done about it. And so trust went up in media and trust went up in the, actually in that case, in that instance, in the institutions of government, because there was a, 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 a useful response. Um, a great story about my barrier. Um, but a lot of what we've been talking about lately has to do with the problems in local journalism and journalism in general in the United States, in Canada. Um, what is your sense of what is, how does the solutions, the solution that you propose apply to the problems that you're seeing? Let's, let's just take Canada because we spent a lot of time talking about that earlier this week. So what Journalists for Human Rights does is in a situation where we've got a cratering of local news, journalists under attack both from without, uh, foreign actors, bad actors, bad politicians, um, uh, uh, blaming the media, using the Stalinistic phrase, the media is the enemy of the people, et cetera, et cetera. I can't think who's doing that in New York country, but it is happening. Uh, and on the flip side, you've got the internal cratering of the business model. So it's a perfect storm. It's a perfect storm of problems. And meanwhile, you've got social media platforms where there's this, to use Maria Ressa's fabulous phrase, sludge of disinformation and misinformation and malinformation that circulates constantly on social media platforms. And people don't know what to believe. And so the way that we have chosen to tackle this wicked set of challenges is threefold. First, you need to work with media, government, and civil society to make the positive argument again and again for each new generation for journalism. In a scenario where journalism is under attack, people need to remember and be reminded that journalists work for them and that the reason that we have journalists is so that we can make informed decisions in a democracy. That is, that is the base. But then you have the disinformation problem. How do you make informed decisions if we're fighting about the very facts with which we're trying to inform ourselves, if facts are being politicized? You know, when the public health, uh, uh, when the COVID-19 started, I thought, okay, well, you know, this is going to be journalism's golden moment because we're all going to need access to reliable public health information only to see through dis and misinformation that public health science information become weaponized and politicized in ways that cause people, you know, like there, there are studies that have been done that show that people who relied on Fox News through the pandemic died at a greater rate than people who were accessing information from other sources. And so our, our, the third prong of our, of, of, of our, of our approach is, is not just to acknowledge the issue and call it out, but to help journalists and the general public understand the, tool, the tools that they need to be able to navigate this morass of disinformation and misinformation. So we worked with, uh, with Craig Silverman, who coined the term fake news. I don't know whether he's proud of it, but he did coin the term uh, back in the day. So we worked with Craig. And we work with a man named Marcus Kolga, who is Canada's leading uh, expert on Russian disinformation, to develop a training curriculum for journalists and social media influencers so that they could fact check and safely debunk and watch for patterns in disinformation campaigns as they're breaking across social media. And I can give you a few examples. For example, does anyone remember the, the, the standoff between the indigenous elder Nathan Phillips and the kid from Covington? Remember that? I do. <laughs> so Twitter investigated because there was some strange activity on the site. This is pre-Elon Musk Twitter, just to be clear. <laughs> um, and, uh, and it came to light that there was a quote unquote California teacher who was retweeting the video of these two glowering at one another millions and millions of times an hour. Again, to quote Maria Ressa, a lie repeated a million times becomes truth. 
or an image that seems to somehow, you know, in an iconic way represent a huge social cleavage repeated a million times an hour can become a source of dissension. And it came to light that that teacher in California was actually a bot farm in Brazil. And so the spot farm in Brazil had identified sort of, you know, the debate between white settlers and the indigenous first peoples of this country as a major potential social cleavage, a source of division. And they were going to whip up that division so that people, when they went online, would take sides and get angry and hit the rage button and, you know, and, and that, and that the, the sides would entrench, the dissension would entrench. I can give you a Canadian example from uh, the truckers convoy. Uh, who here knows about the truckers convoy in Ottawa? You want to just stick up your hand? Like a little tiny Canadian protest that should never, ever have made American news, let's be honest. But somehow a lot of Americans found out about it because there was an RT reporter, Russia Today reporter, who was dispatched to cover the convoy. And that RT reporter was working with Tucker, Tucker Carlson to make sure that you guys, for some reason that we don't still fully understand, were being fully informed about this strange group of people who had showed up on Parliament Hill, the very antithesis of typical Canadian protests. Canada's motto, your motto is, uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Canada's motto, for better or worse, is peace, order, and good government. So just to give you an idea of how this weird, like how odd it was to have this rabble of people on Parliament Hill, all calling, many of whom were calling for the violent overthrow of a democratically elected government. And so this was happening uh, the first week of February last year, a week before the government of Justin Trudeau had announced military support for Ukraine. So I called up Marcus Kolga, our leading uh, preeminent expert in Russian disinformation. I was like, Marcus, there's no way that it's a coincidence that we announced military support for Ukraine and a week later, there's a seditious movement calling for the overthrow of a democratically elected government on Parliament Hill. Could you put a couple of the researchers on the social media accounts that are whipping up support for this convoy? Just curious to see what we find. Within two and a half weeks, the, the, the Line Canada and the Line.ca, two of the, the leading accounts organizing this protest online, were sharing Lavrov's statement about the special operation. But just so that people understand the extent to which we're vulnerable, the extent to which, which we're being played on social media all the time. And so the, 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 the piece that I that I really wanted to uh, emphasize in our disinformation discussion from Monday, and I'm very happy because the Global Mail's editor decided to do this, is uh, uh, recruiting journalists who are going to be covering these patterns as, as what they are, which is propaganda campaigns that are intended to, uh, to cause dissension. And in some cases, in the case of malinformation, intended to call, cause uh, actual physical harm. I mean, some of what we talked about um, in terms of solutions to this problem um, was kind of media literacy for young people and for everyone. Um, but you said something interesting that people, there's so much information, misinformation, disinformation that people don't know what to believe. Um, how much of that is true and how much of it is people know what to believe, but um, have decided to choose up sides and believe what is politically convenient for their political purposes? Really good question. I think one of the things that has changed in my many years on earth and more than that um, <laughs> is, uh, for example, uh, last, two months ago, I, was, I had the good fortune to be in Mexico. Uh, and I randomly stayed at the same hotel in Mexico City that I'd stayed at 10 years before because I went to Mexico City for another thing, uh, actually reporting in that case. And, uh, and what had changed is that the, the rooftop um, uh, restaurant where we, people had breakfast 10 years ago, there were newspapers everywhere in that restaurant. Two months ago, there wasn't a single newspaper. And so my concern is that whether or not we realize it, we have all chosen that it's, you know, we, we're on our phones constantly. That's where we get our information. That's where we think we get our news. We subscribe to NPR feeds. Uh, we subscribe to the Globe and Mail. We, we, we work to inform ourselves. But, it is, but in an environment where we then go on social media 
you are inundated constantly with this stream of information, some of which is calculated, designed to get you to take a point of view as a side, to, to harden your opinion on a given issue. That's just how the algorithm works because it profits the social media companies for information to go viral. And the information that's going viral is the information that gets people riled up and enraged. And so my concern is, you know, facts are, facts are fundamental to govern, governing in a democracy, but emotion trumps facts. And that's what, that's my concern, is what we're seeing is a world in which we're making decisions based on our, our, our gut emotions rather than our dispassionate weighing of facts. So um, if you've been here before, and some of you have, you've heard my kind of concern that so much of what we do has to do with policy and politics and not as much about people and in some ways as a result emotion um some of what i think we have failed to capture accurately is how people feel about their their own particular lives um, and so in some ways i think we're getting beaten at our own game by literally algorithms that have decided that this is the way to move people. And we have been playing a objectivity, neutrality, we have no agenda game that I think is failing us. Uh, what do we do about that? Take back the advantage. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that we can do is journalists are storytellers, journalists are communicators. Uh, you know, any journalist worth their salt knows that when you're writing a big, dry, systemic story, you don't write just, you don't write about the report. You don't quote, you know, X faceless expert and Y faceless expert. You go out, you find an individual, a compelling human being who becomes the face of that story. And you see the universe in that grain of sand. You show the human implications of the story in a way that helps to uh, that helps people to relate uh, to the issue. And I can give an example from a, a recent story uh, writing about climate change. Could there be anything more potentially sometimes both terrifying but also chewy uh, to get into as a journalist? How many people here are journalism students? But writing about climate data, science, you're nodding your head. <laughs> Uh, you know what I'm talking about. So I looked for somebody and, and I was I had been asked to write about the Great Green Wall Initiative uh, across the Sahel, which I knew a little bit about because we've done some climate work with Journalists for Human Rights. And so I spoke with someone who'd become a climate researcher and an advocate and, a, and an, an advisor who himself had been displaced by climate change. His, his, he, he had lived in a part of, uh, of Western Kenya where the floods had gone from once a year to seven times a year. When your farm is flooding seven times a year, you no longer have a farm. And so used, I used his story as the way in to trying to underscore the urgency of this issue for people who are you know, taking it on the chin and frankly had the least to do with it. Um, but, but the point being, there are tools that we can use. But the other piece that we have not explored enough, I don't think in the, in the realm of journalism, is, is, is fighting fire with fire. We need our own bot farms, uh, tweeting out facts and truths millions of times an hour. Because this is you know, a situation where if you leave a vacuum, the disinformation is just going to come in and take over. And so why not have bot farms for journalists? And this is just some, I mean, this is completely speculative. I don't really think it's really possible, but I know it's not yeah. that expensive and it doesn't have to be that, that sophisticated uh, in order for uh, this kind of information. Uh, to uh, to start to flood these these spheres again. The other solution, and we heard about a little bit about this on on Monday, that I find particularly compelling, in the absence of any effective regulation, and regulation is very very complicated, um, is 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 working with advertisers so that they understand and are are more wary of the risks they run running ads on platforms where they don't know if their ad is going to pop up next to something you know, from the Proud Boys or an ISIS video of a girl being beheaded in the name of honor or whatever it might be. That is currently happening to many brands and it's not being sufficiently documented. Mm -hmm. So another role for journalists is to document those problems and a role for those like myself who run NGOs that advocate for journalists is to show 
advertisers the risk of that. Uh, and the, the de-risking strategy is to step away from the platforms, the lowest common denominator, and start uh, advertising with reliable news organizations again. This is so much fun. All I get to do is ask questions. It's awesome. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah. So here's the thing that happened if you subscribe to a local newspaper, whether it's the Globe and Mail, the Ronald Times, the Philadelphia Inquirer. The very act of subscribing to your local newspaper means that you're, you're opting into a certain community. Um, you're going to read that newspaper and you're going to find things that you didn't know you were interested in. You're going to skip over things because it's not interesting to you. Um, the reason you renew month after month, year after year, is because you see yourself reflected in that product. And to the extent that we didn't do that is why we lost a lot of people. Is there any way to reimagine that on a different platform? I, I think that that is happening. Yeah, this is a tough one. So this gets to the heart of what has, I mean, the crisis in journalism, the rush to access journalism over accountability journalism, um, and, you know, sort of the scenario in which the diversity of people working in newsrooms changed in a way that created, you know, problems uh, because people were, were not, no longer reporting on, you know, what's going to happen to truckers when you have self-driving trucks because nobody has got a family member who's a truck driver anymore, right? Um, and, and those kinds of issues. Uh, I do believe that it's possible because what we are going through is a radical uh, shift of medium. Uh, people still care about news. They still want to know what's going on. Still want to uh, have access to reliable information through the pandemic. We did see, uh, you know, significant upticks in uh, subscriber bases for um, the Washington Post, the New York Times, NPR. Mm -hmm. The fact that NPR exists and is supported by viewers is, in and it's of itself, a victory for local journalism. Um, but I think what we are going to see, to need to see more of, is uh, uh, you know, folks like you who are going into the profession. Uh, really taking on board this ethos of people-centered reporting and running with it. And, you know, say you have, you know, you don't, you don't have that much space in your online news, you know, you're, you're only given, what, 800 words to tell a story. Tell the rest of the story on Twitter and ask people what they think, for example, and then start to engage people in an on, online conversation about the information that you've been able to find and share, uh, for example. Um, or uh, when it comes to Instagram, you know, you've got the capacity to then tell stories through video as well um, and using video in, in creative ways. Uh, but the, the real challenge that we face, and it's a wicked challenge, is that with this Instagram, uh, Twitter, et cetera, we've ended up with millions of people with a curated news feed of me. And, and the narcissism has <laughs> gone crazy uh, and the lack of attention to the larger social fabric in which we all, uh, in which we all exist and to which we all contribute, that is the piece where that's the challenge for the next generation of journalists is to figure out how do we get these millions of people curating their newsfeed of themselves to start to care more about things that are much bigger than themselves through really good journalism. Now that is what, that has always been the challenge of journalism. Now the, the question is, how do we get some of those bigger issues into those Instagram feeds, you know, into the, 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 um, uh, the podcasts, into the, the LinkedIn threads, et cetera. And, and that is, uh, it's, it's, it's tricky, but it's also exciting because I'll give you an example, um, uh, this in the last couple of months, it has been my immense privilege to work with one of Canada's finest journalists, Lisa Laflamme, who uh, until recently was the main anchor for CTV National News. Uh, she was fired allegedly because uh, she, she let her hair go gray through COVID. Uh, you may have heard some of this. Times Washington Post is also. I tried to take a picture of her, and I was going to make a hair joke. Yeah, I decided, yeah. <laughs> I decided not to do that. that. Smart man. Uh, that's why you're you're where you are. Um, uh, 
but Lisa, so I sent Lisa to uh, Kenya and Tanzania and I asked her, you know, like we've been hearing all these reports about the great work that our teams are doing, but I'm, I, I want to send a journalist you, uh, you know, let me know, are they actually doing what we're hearing they, they're doing? Like what's actually happening in these different environments? Sometimes it's hard to know when you're sitting in Canada and writing endless reports and et cetera. Um, and so she went and she documented the impact of a number of these stories that our journalists have been helping to produce. Uh, and when she came back, she didn't have a platform, right? Like she, she's no longer working for CTV. And so we were like, okay, so where are we gonna share these stories? And the logical answer was YouTube because she is a public figure with a huge platform on Twitter and on Instagram. YouTube is what will allow her to share her stories for at, at whatever length for as long as she wants. And we can work with her to build the social media momentum so that these stories get a mass audience. So just, just to come back to your question, these are stories about huge human rights issues, nothing to do with the, the newsfeed of me. They're about you know, how women and girls were affected by lockdowns in Kenya and Tanzania, the kinds of social issues that came from that, and some of the solutions, the local solutions that came from spotlighting those issues. And they've had a massive, massive audience. Now, I got to work with Lisa Laflamme. When you start out, you have to build your, pro your, your, your profile and your platform. But the reality is you can get these social media tools that we are complaining about in the earlier part of this conversation to work for you in order to drive audience attention to the kinds of issues you think people should be paying attention to. And that's really exciting. Yeah, and I will say one upside to, to the, the feed of me and the is that you can see what people are interested in. Because I mean, it's, it's interesting. It's, it, I mean, what people share are things that people think are shareable and connective and there's, there's stories to tell there. Um, and if you have not seen the Lisa Lafam uh, documentaries, you should go look at it. They are fantastic. Um, I didn't until late last week, uh, so. Um, when we talked originally, we talked about um, this idea, because I was thinking about this, this seminar even then, um, kind of the connection between journalism and democracy and what was happening around the world. And you said about the United States, you're getting close to a danger point. Um, talk a little bit about that. So ordinarily, Journalists for Human Rights is working in places like South Sudan and Mali and Liberia and places like this. We would never, I, I brought our programming home to Canada because I, I thought that there were issues, indigenous uh, issues, issues with uh, major systemic human rights stories that needed attention at home. But never in a million years did I think that you know, the United States might be a place that we might want to look at in terms of an engagement or an intervention. Then January 6th happened. Uh, Patrick Melody, who is here today, uh, has been on my case for a long time about looking at doing something uh, meaningful and useful in the United States. And I, I had been just, I was just like, you know, the joke in Canada, you know, what's the world's most boring headline according to the New York Times, worthwhile Canadian initiative. Well, you know, worthwhile Canadian initiative. So no, that's not <laughs> So what, but what, but, but after Jan 6 happened, I started, I said, okay, let's, let's run the exercise. Let's take a look actually at how the U.S. stacks up against the rest of the world. Every time we look at a new place where we're considering an intervention, we look at the press freedom index that Reporters Without Borders maintains. And we look at something called the global peace index as well, which assesses the level of conflict or violence in a given environment. So the United States at the time was, I think it was number 45 on the Press Freedom Index, major drop between the Obama years and the Trump years, no surprise to anyone here, I'm sure, but you know, around about number 45. Oh. Peace Index was the, was the index that shocked me the most. Out of 162 countries, with 162 being you know, basically full on war, where do you think the US fell January 7th, 2021? Just rough guess. 162. It's not that bad. 130. Close, 121. 
Jan 6. So just, just south of the Republic of Congo, defined as at low level conflict with itself right now. Guess where it is now? I'm afraid, to, I'm afraid to guess. 129. So it's gone down. So it's gone down. Now, a lot of that is to do with gun violence, obviously, and the and the threat, you know, of of a situation where your entire country is not demobilized. Um, but a lot of the 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 challenges that were embedded in the press freedom drop are related to this whole scale attack on journalists that you have seen. And I have friends who work for the New York Times who tell me that if you're a Times reporter and you go to cover a Trump rally, you can walk into the barn or the arena or wherever they're holding the rally and there will be photographs of journalists with gun sights on the journalists' faces. So this is the kind of thing that we have seen in places like South Sudan, in places like Congo, in places like Syria. And Therefore, uh, once uh, I had done this research and took this on board, I realized, you know what, there might be something useful to be had simply in coming here and talking about this and showing Americans where they're stacking up, what's actually happening, what's at risk. You've talked at length in other seminars about the, link, the clear link between the, the strength of democracy and the strength of journalism and what can be done about it. And our, our core insight, and I'll give you an example from our South Sudan program, is you have in a situation like this where journalists are actively under attack, you have to make an active argument for journalism. You have to identify champions for journalism within government, media, and civil society. You have to put those three things together so that journalists and civil society and government are all working to remind the next generation, to explain to the next generation uh, of people in that country why journalism matters. And through all of that, the through line again is it all comes back to people. If people see that their issues are being written about, talked about, broadcast, shared, and that something useful is happening, whether it be just simply validation or some sort of strong governance response, like the Liberia example I shared with you, they put trust in media and in the institution of democracy. In South Sudan, when we first arrived, week before I got to Juba, the president said, hmm, people should shoot journalists for reporting against the state. The following day, a journalist was shot going home from his, uh, from his newsroom. The, there was open conflict between journalists and government, and there was no clear way out. What we did, we took the, the head of the media authority, which was the internal government agency that supposedly had responsibility for journalists, and we put him in a room with all of his regional counterparts. And there was not a white face in that room, just to be clear. It was all people from East Central Africa. And they explained to him, look, you're behaving like a thug. You're shutting down uh, news outlets. You're censoring journalists. You're kicking people out of the country and you're letting people die. Or you are actively <laughs> commissioning killing, depending on where, uh, on, the, on the case in question. This has to stop. Whatever, whatever was shared in that, in that room, he came out of that room. He decided to commit his political capital to championing the interests of journalists. And since November 2017, no journalist has died in the course of their work in South Sudan. Which told me, wow, if this is possible in South Sudan, it's possible anywhere. But you, it's about education. It's about media literacy. It's about news literacy. And it's about constantly making the positive argument for journalism in places that have forgotten why journalism matters. I don't know the answer to this question. I'm not, I'm not even sure exactly what the question is. But the fact that we are targeted, whether it's here or in South Sudan or Liberia, to me, underscores the fact of our importance. It, um, and so on some level, we're, we're we're working from some position of strength as we try to solve this problem. But I, I, I think I have two more questions. One is, um, I think we're talking about a pretty high level of, of journalism in the United States and in Canada. What, what do we need to do to deal with the issue of, better journalism generally 
and the kind of journalism that we've been talking about, which is the people-centered work that um, we think is a solution to the problem. How do we support it, you mean? How do we need to encourage it? it it's, it's almost a, how do we support it? How do we, but how do we kind of define it so that, you know, all the stories on the front page of the New York Times tomorrow are not going to be about, you know, some bill in the Senate. I love the Senate. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote a whole book about it. Um, I read it. <laughs> oh, this is getting worse. <laughs> how, I mean, how, how do we underline the importance of that work as opposed to this? I think what I think of. I mean, I literally had this problem myself. I, I, was, I was a reporter in Philadelphia. Um, that I would, I would go to work not knowing what I was going to write about because there was going to be something happening in Philadelphia that was going to be like ridiculous and amazing. And I would go do it. Um, and at some point, I started telling my boss, I want to be on the politics staff. Those are the people who get all the prestige. He's like, you're a great street reporter. Embrace your gifts. Um, and that was that was true for me. I love, I used to say there are no stories in that newsroom because I didn't want to be on the phone. But there is this bias toward what we think of as kind of the important stuff. <laughs> and I say this as somebody who wrote the book on the set. <laughs> How do we get away from those people? Well, we start to make, frankly, we start to make the business argument to the management. And that's what we did uh, in some of these environments. We, uh, uh, you know, people, you know, the journalists were fascinated by what was going on in the Senate, uh, the up and down, you know, horsemanship of, uh, of politics. But people didn't care because they weren't seeing their issues in Bill, Bill X or Movement Y or Cabal Z or lobbyists, you know, whomever. They were not seeing themselves. They were not seeing their issues. And so they disengage because, you know, uh, you, 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 you think that this, this media is talking to itself and talking to this elite group of people. And there's nothing in it for me. So, so why should I pay attention to that? Because there's nothing in it for me. Uh, and so we, uh, for example, in Liberia, we, we worked with uh, our trainers on, and again, there was also a financial reason for this. They, every, all the journalists were asking for transportation money, which we didn't have. So we worked with them to say, okay, you're going to do stories called Where We Live on Your Communities. Go to your community and find a core, a key issue that everyone is annoyed about or frustrated with. It could be lack of access to clean market clean water in a, in, a, in a wet market, for example, or it could be this issue that ended up being this national story about how nobody's, uh, the, the schools weren't getting the money that they were supposed to be getting. Um, but everyone's going to take stories from their communities and they're going to write those stories from their perspective in their voice in a way that was going to, to resonate with local audiences. And they saw their audiences go up. Those outlets that had uh, websites saw readership go up. They were able to then monetize that readership and they generated more advertising that they then were able to plow back into their news organizations. And that, that is the only way that I can think of. I mean, I've worked in, you know, journalists are not Pollyanna types. They are hard nosed and they are desperate in one sense because of the situation that we're seeing with the, the financial implosion. There has to be a strong business argument for why it is so important that we return to uh, a, a focus on people's stories and shoe leather journalism and going out into communities in order to be able to show people who they are and what they're grappling with in a way that creates positive discussions and positive change. And that's, that, that, that's been something that's been true in all the newsrooms that I've worked with, but also in, in Canada, but also uh, uh, right around the world. And it's difficult because people think that you know the, the, the power source is where the prestigious roles are. And I don't have a magic bullet for how to change that. 
except to tell you know these news editors and reporters and uh, or uh, um, uh, media outlets bluntly, you are making yourselves irrelevant. And when you are irrelevant, you will no longer exist. Well, you guys have heard me say, the solution to the problem is that we cannot have journalists who start by covering Congress. You have to start by covering the local school board, the local planning commission, um, the local car wreck. Um, I, I had a friend, mentor, who told me my first newspaper job that we had to cover the car, the two car wrecks where nobody died. I was like, well, why is that news? Like one, it ties up the traffic and everybody notices. And two, you have to interview the people who were in the wreck because they're not dead. <laughs> <laughs> and they are the voice of all the people who will be reading that because it could have happened in any case. Um, one last thing. Um, we talked, we've talked about all the problems involved in everything we've talked about. Um, why are you optimistic about this? Because I know you are. Because it, because it fundamentally matters for people who believe in a democratic way of life. And democratic way of life is messier and more complicated. And there is a definite slide in this and other countries, including my country, towards, oh, you know, democracy is messy and inefficient and disorganized. And, you know, it'd be better if there was just some strong guy who, who told us all what to do and think. And it would be just easier that way. I can focus more on my own things when that's going on. Uh, but the reality is, is that, uh, Societies are stronger when you have a diversity of people governing them and weighing in on how to govern them and informing them. Uh, there has never been a famine in a country with a free press for a good reason. The press points out where the, the, the government's decisions are going wrong and the government corrects. And when we're in a really difficult situation facing a really autocratic government like we are currently in the Democratic Republic of Congo, that's what I remind the government. You need these people in order to govern more effectively and to shore up support for your, for your, 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 your way of life. But when it comes to people in this, in this environment, in this country, we are storytellers. The American way of life is built on an understanding that you have a dream, that you can follow your dream, and that life will be better once you have, when, when, when you are able to sort of uh, uh, self-actualize from your own narrative. Um, and there's something so incredibly beautiful and powerful about that and compelling. Uh, there is a reason that people still look to the United States as the quote unquote leader of the quote unquote free, free world. And I think that will continue for as long as people tell and share stories. And I've seen that, I've, I've, I've lived and worked all over the world, and, and that still remains to be true. Uh, people want uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, even if they come from peace, order, and good government. Uh, they don't necessarily want uh, to be in an environment where, you know, as I was when I was growing up in Lesotho, and the apartheid state of South Africa took over the government, and there was a curfew for a number of weeks where if you left your house between the hours of 6 p.m. and 6 a.m., you would be shot on sight. That is not uh, a, a tenable or useful or valuable way to organize a society. This is. And so just knowing that and owning that and owning your, uh, your, your future, uh, your interest in journalism, um, and taking that in a direction where you can contribute the richness and wealth of the stories of all the different people who have come to make their lives in this, in this country, um, that is a powerful and dynamic thing. You guys would have been really proud of me. I was in Canada on Monday to talk about misinformation. And I said that one thing as journalists we had to give up was this idea that we had no agenda um, and that we had to find one. And one way to look at it would be to think of our agenda as truth, justice, and the American way. Canadians went wild for that. <laughs> <laughs> but, what, what, but what David Walmsley, so the editor of the Globe and Mail was hosting this event 
And at the end, he, he had a really beautiful summation, I thought, of the, of the discussion where he said, you know, this is actually about our way of life. It's about our way of life. It's about a way of life where people are allowed to disagree and allowed to inform themselves and make informed decisions based on reaching out for that information. And without a strong media, you don't have that. So this is actually fundamentally about your, uh, shoring up your way of life, protecting it, because it is something precious and rare and very, very valuable. And with that, we're going to open it up to your questions. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Maddie. I'm a journalism student here. This you touched on this. We also talked about this in the last talk, where I forget who said it. Someone said that journalism is becoming reactive and not proactive, and this kind of connects, I guess, to the idea like we're covering politicians instead of the people. I like that idea, and I like believe in it. But like, when do you cover politicians without becoming reactive? Double. And to give them ideas, frankly. Uh, so, uh, uh, when I was in, when I was a, at one point, I was a reporter here. I worked for a magazine called Canadian Business, uh, and I was covering, amongst other things, you know, the sort of shift towards buy American policies because that had obviously ramifications for Canadian business across the border. Uh, and so I decided to focus on, you know, talking to people who had been affected by all of these massive economic changes that have happened in your country, in Pennsylvania, of all of all states, um, in order to to understand, you know, like if 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 an industry was wiped out by automation, what happened? And the result, the 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 you know, the people that I spoke to said, well, nothing. <laughs> like I was just, you know, I I was I was. Uh, in a sense, uh, uh, automated out of a job, um, and uh, and 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 so then I would go and talk to the three. The, it was the period of the the primaries, uh, so Obama, Clinton, and McCain's campaigns were all in Pennsylvania because it was a big swing state. Um, and I spoke to the, each campaign and asked them about this issue, uh, and none of them had particularly good answers for how to take care of people who had lost their jobs uh, through such a process of automation. And so I put that in my stories because that's that's holding these candidates who are looking for your vote to account to in the, the, the reality that they didn't actually have clear ideas or good plans for so many people in this swing state that they've also so coveted um, uh, in, in, in you know, addressing a fundamental economic issue. Um, so, you know, it's like, talk to the people first, get their issue. In, in, in our curriculum, we call this, you know, center the voices of those affected in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the story, then talk to the quote unquote duty bearer, the person who's responsible, in theory anyway, or the people who could be responsible or people who want to be responsible and ask them for their plan or their point of view. They may not have a plan, but chances are if they really want government, they'll scramble a plan. And then an interesting idea starts to float out there about, okay, this is something, you know, this is a solution, a potential solution to a problem that we didn't understand the scope of before. And that, that's what happened in the Liberia education story. You know, I don't think the, the Johnson Sirleaf was maybe looking at the other way. I don't know. But the reality was, was that her minister was corrupt. And once we had 20 outlets exposing the extent of that, she had to do something about it. And it was positive. And the key thing in that reporting is to not think that what the campaign says or what the candidate says is any more important. Um, yes. In fact, it is probably a lot less important yes. than what the regular person says. Hi, my name is Alyssa. I'm a communication student in the first year. Um, so I found the discussion about the global peace effects really interesting. Um, and I was wondering what the sort of like metrics are that like go into that calculation, what like that sort of like how we come to that ranking, and how I guess the issues that we've had in the US with misinformation and disinformation has impacted that pretty abysmal ranking that we have. Great question. Uh, so on the peace index, and I can share the link if people are interested after this uh, this discussion. Uh, basically, the me the main metric is how many people die violently, <laughs> which unfortunately in your country, because of the way that your gun laws are, is like by a fact uh, by a quantum factor compared to the next uh, uh, environment in which there are a large number of guns. 
uh, that are allowed in civil society. So that that's the conundrum for anyone who's not American is, you know, why do people, why, why the guns? It's hard to understand. Um, but that is the, the key factor. Um, uh, but then when it comes to the mis and disinformation question, well, uh, you were, you're, you're, uh, when I was fortunate enough to sit down with Maria Ressa, the Filipino journalist, she showed me graphs that she, her, she has this technology that she's developed through her news site Rappler, where she can track viral disinformation campaigns as they are happening. Uh, she showed me the 25 Facebook accounts that helped to manipulate the outcome of the Filipino election in 2016. And she was also able to show me in graphic form how disinformation was shaping the public narrative here in, in the United States uh, in a way that, um, that drove an enormous amount of support to Trump that was unexpected. Uh, so, you know, I think electing Trump was probably, you know, trying to keep the partisanship out of this conversation, but electing somebody who quoted Stalin about the role of the media had a very, very significant impact on uh, how it, it, it emboldened, it emboldened uh, people who didn't like journalists to begin with to then start to target them in ugly, ugly ways. So that's the clearest link that I can think of. Thank you. I just want to follow up on something Maddie said because I think you know you said holding political officials count accountable. But isn't it also important that journalists share when government does positive things yes. or good things? Because I'm a little concerned about the public perception of what happens in government, but I also think during COVID, only certain citizens should be informed about and their access to government programs or funding or you know things so so that's a, is that an important part too absolutely absolutely so one of the things we started to do through COVID, actually was we formed a partnership with the solutions journalism network which i also encourage you guys to take a look at started by david bornstein um uh, and tina rosenberg who write the fix column for the new york times and the conceit there is to look at what's working as journalists. So what worked in a given you know, environment, a, a smart policy decision or an interesting you know, after school program or something that helped to ensure that a situation got better. And then to tease out, okay, what were the various factors that allowed that policy choice or that governance decision or whatever to work? And are these things scalable or adaptable or what learning can we take from these uh, experiences? And it has a lot of applicability to climate reporting. Um, certainly we've, we've used a lot of solutions and principles in our climate to work in Southern Africa. Uh, but yes, also to when it comes to, to um, building confidence in institutions of government, uh, one of the things that we found is that we would work with journalists to center the voices of those affected, quote the people who were responsible. There was usually some bright spark within the, the, the sort of ranks of the responsible who wanted to come up with a solution. And then we would profile that person as they were working towards a solution in a way that helped to, to sort of establish a precedent in a very public forum of government working for people. And that's that's been a fairly key concept, conceit for our work throughout, like whether we're working in Syria or Mali or in Canada. Um, uh, I'll get an example of from our indigenous program, uh, we had sent a trainer to work in a, a Constance Lake, which was a small indigenous community in Northern Ontario, which practiced part-time policing. So the police were off in the, in the evenings and there were no cops there on weekends. So, you know, with a certain amount of humor, because these communities are, you know, you know one, of the, one of the fabulous things about Northern Ontario and community, Indigenous communities is the fabulous sort of dry sense of humor to a lot of the dumb things that have happened historically in, these, in this particular demographic. Uh, this, you know, we worked with this guy who was a, a popular radio show host to talk about, you know, well, how, how is part-time policing working for you? Can you share some of the stories of what happens when the police leave the community? And of course, it's all the bad stuff, the crime, et cetera. Um, and, but as a result of those stories, there should not be asking uh, police services board designated two full-time police officers to go and work in that community. And so this guy covered the police officers and he covered the fact that the, the, the police services board had shown that leadership and that the solution was positive for the community. Um, we're talking about Syria, but sorry. sorry. Um, 
And she was mentioning it earlier, the reason for you know politics we take and I both in the UCs and often focus on you know real stories of the real push. But I feel there were a lot of political polarization that has come from you know larger scale media corporations. A lot of like sex sectors of life which haven't necessarily been politically impacted the home political, such as education, healthcare, a lot of other factors. So what are ways to make sure that these other sectors of um community life remain um, unbiased in terms of local news story and approach. Yeah, I mean, I don't think, I mean, I know exactly what you're talking about, you know, these huge people showing up at school board meetings. Um, I mean, I think a lot of that has to do with disinformation um, and people using kind of the apparatus of uh, government to kind of promote their own kind of political agenda. And I think that makes absolute sense. Part of the reason it's happening, though, is because of this vacuum in local news. And so we, we can't not cover politics when it becomes important. But if we cover the concerns of people before that happens, then I think the political outcome looks a little different because um, I think people are more invested in it in a way that uh, that makes that makes sense as opposed to just some kind of movement or campaign, which I think is a lot of what you see um, in these uh, most recent uh, events. What one of the one of the things that we uh, have encouraged journalists to do in environments that where it is very like like this one apparently where it's dangerous sometimes to cover certain types of stories in certain environments uh, is just to focus on an issue that is cross cutting for you know like a, a health issue or an access to clean water issue like the Flint uh, water uh, problem for example tell that story from a number of different perspectives you know centering the voices of those affected in the story and then show that the solution isn't actually blue or red there just there needs to be a solution based on the facts of the problem and that tends to drive that then means that the, the journalists working for the people have regained control of the public narrative from the politicization of it the issue and the people who are affected by it are front and center and then the result the, the solution can come from either blue or red but it's it, it's it's uh, it, it the 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 focus of the discussion and the and the public uh, coverage becomes how do we solve this problem? Not this is a blue pro problem or a red problem or what have you. Now I appreciate the partisanship in 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 this country has been pretty out of control over the last few years. But when you are foregrounding a core issue that people are grappling with and trying to uh, ensure. The, that there is a broader understanding of the human cost of this problem. I'll give you another example. So Afghanistan, we worked on the, uh, we, we, we've been helping to evacuate journalists and human rights defenders from Afghanistan for the past two and a bit years now, um, since uh, uh, August, 2021, uh, so almost, almost two years. Uh, and one of the things that uh, really struck me about that effort was we would write stories and work with journalists in Canada to write stories about some of these people and, and the way that their lives were upended. That would then kick off a wave of engagement from across the political spectrum of what the hell do we do in a scenario where we were responsible. We, we had 13 years of investment in Afghanistan, and then we just are leaving these people hanging. And I've never experienced anything like sort of tripartisan support for the work that we were doing in order to try and ensure that these people got, got to safety, that there was enough space uh, from, you know, Canada took, uh, uh, took 40,000 Afghans and that has been a really big um, uh, uh, contribution to this whole effort. But it was about foregrounding people's stories, how they were being affected by issues, and then uh, calling on decision makers of all political stripes to solve these, these difficult problems. Um, and and that, uh, that, that, that means that the issue and the person affected by it is driving the agenda, not the politician who has a very much an agenda of their own. Um, 
I'm going to give you the last question, but let me see if there's there's another one out there. What's up? Hi there. Um, <laughs> so when talking about coming to the U.S. with Jared um, Chido, um, what is the discussion? Are there any sort of concerns with application of methods um, equally? Have you done in countries like South Sudan? Um, how those would apply in the U.S. Like, I guess, like, what sort of different actions would you take? Just because they're they're very different countries. Yeah. So our first principle is we localize everything. So before we, I mean, and again, I, I, I don't know who would fund this. I don't know what scope it would be. It might be like a series of workshops or a full blown program is, you know, working with all media partners across the sector, plus government, plus civil society, millions of dollars. I don't know if that's something that is even on the cards, but, uh, but what we what we would ordinarily do is identify. Uh, first of all, we'd do a needs assessment, so we talk to media organizations across the spectrum uh, to find out what you know how they're all grappling with this problem of being targeted because they all are facing it in different ways. Um, and we would then work to build an advisory board of leading journalists and thinkers on journalism who would then help us to staff and shape our program because. There's no point, you know, I can show up and can't, I, I, I'm, I'm not from here. I don't understand, you know, the deep intricate nuances of the various culture wars and issues that you guys are navigating, um, but you do, for example. So, you know, if, if we were to start a program here, we would look for a journalist of, of Terry's caliber or somebody who was, you know, really keen to take on this, frankly, wicked problem and would be the public face of this program um, and we would work with their leadership uh, currency, if you like, to then reach out to people who want to engage in a program of this kind, but need to do it in an American way. Uh, and that's that's just, I mean, every one of our programs is 100% staffed by people from those countries. We send international experts on their own dime to do training uh, and that's fun, but the, the focus of the program is helping uh, resource media sectors so that they're taking the partisanship out of the reporting, they have champions in government, they have champions in civil society, and that there is this ongoing multi-year effort to make a positive argument for journalism. And that can only be done through people who are credible within that media space. For the record, I did not plan that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. Rachel. This was fabulous. Um, it is exactly the conversation I thought we needed to have um, and more. And um, I'm really glad you could do it. So thanks, everyone. And <laughs>